Amigos de Cartago, otro encuentro en estas gélidas jornadas que nos está regalando el norte de la Patagonia, el clima patagónico, este frío eh, inclemente. De todas maneras es bueno aclarar, sobre todo a la luz de los últimos acontecimientos, que el frío no mata, lo que mata es una política del Estado. Eh, en el medio de eso nosotros teníamos muchas ganas de encarar unos eh, trabajos, unos materiales que teníamos para acompañar una de las noticias más eh, trágicas de este año que ha, ha sido, es la entrega del de cuerpo, nada menos, ¿no? de la figura, la presencia eh, de la persona de Julian Assange, uno de nuestros héroes, uno de los grandes héroes que tiene este, hoy el periodismo a nivel mundial y que también está muy silenciada toda su épica efectivamente porque Assange ha enfrentado en cuerpo y alma nada menos que el imperialismo estadounidense. Eh, les decía una de las noticias más trágicas porque no solamente le habían quitado ya su estatus diplomático como refugiado en la embajada ecuatoriana en Londres, sino por otro lado eh, ya venía con mucho maltrato psicofísico desde la llegada del gobierno de Lenín Moreno a la presidencia en Ecuador. Eso iba revelando una, un acto ignominioso que llegó a tener ya un, un ribete eh, público cuando efectivamente el gobierno de eh, Moreno lo entrega prácticamente a la OTAN, lo entrega a la justicia londinense y la justicia londinense ya está haciendo los papeles para entregarlo nada menos que a Estados Unidos. En ese momento es donde la figura de Assange no solamente eh, retoma una vez más la opinión pública mundial, sino también vemos cómo los distintos mecanismos de las prensas hegemónicas van silenciando tanto la vida y la obra de Wikileaks como la situación personal de Julian Assange. Sus abogados y sus abogadas y todos los activistas que están trabajando a brazo partido y en una inferioridad abismal de condiciones frente a la maquinaria imperial, han denunciado que también está siendo torturado de manera química, este, con privación del sueño y con sesiones de tortura este, eh, tremendas que tienen que ver con derrotarlo este, espiritualmente, quebrarlo ideológicamente para tener aún más información respecto a lo que ha eh, dado a conocer Julian Assange. ¿Cuál es el crimen de eh, Assange? ¿Cuál es el crimen de Edward Snowden? ¿Cuál es el crimen de Chelsea Manning? Dar a conocer los mecanismos de ocultamiento, los mecanismos de tortura, los mecanismos de guerra, los mecanismos de secuestro, los mecanismos con los cuales toda una maquinaria logra hundir bajo tierra, bajo lodo, bajo petróleo, bajo sangre a naciones enteras. El caso de Irak, el caso de Afganistán, el caso de lo que está sucediendo en Siria. Eh, de todas maneras, mientras se va desarrollando este acontecimiento, nosotros creíamos importante primero sentar bandera del lado de quién nos íbamos a poner. ¿no? Como humildes comunicadores perdidos en el norte de la Patagonia, dando a conocer una parte de la verdad que nosotros queremos defender, íbamos a plantar esa bandera de exigir la libertad incondicional de eh, Julian Assange y también de Chelsea Manning, que volvió a ser encancelada por el gobierno de Donald Trump. Pero por otro lado, demostrar claramente que hay un periodismo eh, clase mediero, un periodismo que le encanta ver Netflix y ver reflejada esas actitudes de Watergate, pero cuando tienen la noticia enfrente siempre juegan para el lado del poderoso. Pasa acá con el fracking, pasa junto a las comunidades este, originarias, pasa, no sé, en, 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 el, en el sur de la Argentina dando a conocer el caso de Santiago Maldonado. Siempre hay una parte de la historia en la cual el periodismo debe optar por resguardar al poderoso o enfrentarse a él. Bueno, ya sabemos de qué lado se han puesto aquellos periodistas que no han emitido periodistas y periodistas que no han emitido una sola coma, un solo retweet, nada, frente a la detención y al posible enjuiciamiento este, de Julian Assange. Este material que vamos a compartir después de esta larga introducción está situado en uno de los blancos predilectos del trabajo de Julian Assange, que es Google. ¿De dónde viene? ¿Hacia dónde va? ¿En qué se ha transformado Google? Este aliado inestimable que tiene el aparato militar norteamericano, la OTAN, para recopilar datos y espiar a la ciudadanía. ¿Qué pasa cuando un intendente de una ciudad de un pueblito alegremente da a conocer que el autito de Google está sacando fotos? ¿Qué sucede cuando miles de chicos y chicas precarizados 
se meten en un montón de negocios para decirles, ¿sabes si estás en Google? ¿Querés participar? ¿Querés darnos tus datos? ¿Qué pasa con toda esa información? Ese es el puntapié de nuestro trabajo el día de hoy. Nos acompaña a Chelén Santillán en las cámaras en exteriores. Nosotros de esta manera arrancamos hoy nuestro programa. Héroe, Julian Assange. Bienvenidos a Cartago. Google want to meet with you? That's a very interesting question. Uh, it is still not known for sure why Google wanted to meet with me. Uh, the pretext uh, for the meeting was Eric Schmidt, the chairman of Google, together with Jared Cohen, um, someone was hired for Google to set up a sort of mini State Department within Google called Google Ideas, who had immediately worked for Hillary, um, producing a new book uh, called Uh, the new digital age, and that was to be Google's vision for the future of the world, uh, the future of nations, uh, peoples, and information. And they wanted to interview me uh, as part of that. Uh, and that's more or less what we thought it probably was, other than Google trying to pump me for strategic information that it might use in terms of how it would lay out its business over the next 10 years. Uh, but afterwards, uh, it was clear that something else was going on. You describe Eric Schmidt and Jared Cohen as perfectly likable people, but you write that people all over the world should be concerned if the future of the internet is to be Google. Why should people be concerned? You know, people have often said that Barack Obama is a perfectly likable person. I believe that's probably true. It's actually quite hard to get to the top of politics or to be a billionaire. Um, if you're not personable and don't make friends easy or put people at ease. Uh, but it's not about that interpersonal nature. It's about the, the structure which these people are embedded with uh, and what their plans are uh, and what their ideological ideas are and who their allies are. Uh, in the case of Google, we have two things happening at once. On the one hand, we have now what is the second largest company in the United States, $400 billion market capitalization, which has doubled uh, in size since 2011, which has moved its operations into every single part of the world. Uh, more than 1.5 million people per day enter into the Google system uh, just as a result of buying new smartphones. That's an increase of 1.5 million per day. More than the population of the United States every year is entering into that system. Um, and, of course, uh, they collect information uh, from everyone who uses uh, Android uh, telephones, Google search, YouTube, uh, various forms of mail, and other um, industries that they control. And unlike a normal big corporation, which has many different interests, um, it pulls together all this information collection. It's not like it has a YouTube estate here, and Google search there, and Android here. It pulls together all this information, couples it together for each person that they detect, and builds a uh, profile of that person and it collects their history. Uh, and that is its business model. Being a private, uh, lawful version of the National Security Agency, creating free services, seemingly free services, that act as bait uh, to bring in the world's population, to use those services, to give the private information to Google, which Google then stores, indexes, and creates profiles of interest uh, for each person, uh, which it then uses to sell to uh, advertisers. Uh, and uh, at a political level, um, the National Security Agency uh, then couples on top. It doesn't need to collect all that information uh, itself because Google collects it all, brings it back to the United States, and the National Security Agency Uh, then uh, intercepts that information either within Google or as it goes to Google or using this uh, PRISM system uh, which couples uh, to Google itself.
You write that Google's influence on the choices and behavior of the totality of individual human beings translates to real power to influence the course of history. What does a Google future for the world look like? Well, Eric Schmidt, the chairman of Google, and Jared Cohen, the uh, director of Google Ideas, Google's think tank about how to deal with the world, um, have documented it. They documented the new digital age and also another article they wrote called The Empire of the Mind um, that states who were involved in coalitions of their militaries in Iraq can come together with coalitions of the connected uh, and uh, essentially, uh, they don't put it in these terms, but uh, push forward American exceptionalism and um, centrist um, liberalism as sort of defined, I guess, by Hillary Clinton uh, push that into the world. And they see that as a very good vision for the world. They see that they, um, that they believe that uh, the mass invasion of privacy uh, under Western governments is fine because it just allows Western governments to manage their people better and manage the society better and be more responsive to the needs of the people. Uh, but the, exactly the same mass invasion uh, of people's privacy with other governments is something, um, something that is bad. And in, in some ways, it's a banal vision. It's, it's not a, a really politically sophisticated vision or culturally sophisticated vision. Uh, but that is what the people there within that center of American exceptionalism that revolves around uh, the New America Foundation and uh, Google and some of the uh, expensive think tanks uh, in California. Uh, it is a sort of a ban banal culturally insensitive view that American exceptionalism is a good thing and it's just trying to arrange the world uh, to be uh, more liberal uh, and to bring them into the US industrial system because that's what everyone wants. There's a myth in advanced capitalist countries about civil society being a space where people come together free from political influence and manipulation. Google has managed to project an image of corporate responsibility into this space. What role has Google played in civil society? Google, through Google Ideas and a number of other funding arrangements, um, has funded a lot of the high-tech civil society. So those very organizations, which would be scrutinizing Google's activity on the internet, complaining about its ever-expanding industrial uh, private surveillance cone, um, those very organizations it is funding. And as a result, I think we, we don't see proper uh, critical analysis by those organizations. Uh, similarly, every year, uh, Google Ideas runs a private invitation-only conference that really mirrors something that the State Department has been doing uh, since the early 70s, the IVP program or International Visitor Program, whereas it was renamed International Leadership Program. In fact, you can search WikiLeaks for IVP or IVLP and you'll see um, that it goes after young people that they believe will enter into political leadership, perhaps will enter into political leadership or business leadership one day, bring them together with senior people in the United States government uh, and industry and sort of network them into the fold. And that's true, for example, for Sweden's foreign minister, Carl Bildt. That's been true for a number of the British prime ministers, Australian prime ministers. Uh, over 340 uh, global leaders actually were part of that program. So Google has its own version of that that it runs every year. And it brings in uh, activists, some genuine activists from um, around the world in countries that are at odds with US foreign policy agendas, pulls them together and gets them to meet US generals uh, and cybersecurity chieftains uh, and uh, Eric Schmidt and Jared Cohen and uh, other Google staff. Um, and together they create a, um, a matrix or a, a patronage web uh, through which, um, well, certainly US foreign policy agendas, uh, which are co-aligned between Google and the State Department are better able to be executed, um, but also with which Google itself as an institution um, is able to uh, have influence with various uh, players. <laughs>
Let's go.